Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Fix Your Plate with Dr. Monique. I am your host, the physician in the kitchen, two-time Amazon bestseller, paid blogger, consultant, speaker, you name it, and author of the bestselling book, Doc Fix Your Plate, Doc Fix My Plate, the physician in the kitchen's prescriptions for your healthy meal makeover. I am so excited that you are listening to me today on WDRB radio and streaming outlets. I'm super excited, though, that you are listening to me and my new friend, my new BFF, Christian, also known as Afrobeats. I'm so excited that he is here with us today, and um, we're going to get into his story about his plant-based story, and that's and that's Afrobeats, B-E-E-T-S, by the way, so that's super cool. I love, you know, you all know I love a good food um, pun. And so I love his, his best name of his podcast. He's going to tell us all about that. But first, let's talk a little bit about who he is and why he's going to be on the show today. So Christian is a garden to table educator who teaches the African diaspora how to grow food in small spaces and take a nature-based approach to health and wellness. He believes that everyone should have access to good food and nature, regardless of their zip code. When Kristen is not cultivating edible landscapes or facilitating community culinary experiences, he is the host of the Afro Beats podcast, a food and culture show where food and nature are used as a tool to explore the African diaspora. He's also earned a Master Gardener certification from UDC in 2019 and has over five years of growing experience growing food in various gardens across the DMV including the Washington Youth Garden located in the National Arboretum. Well, that is, that's a whole vibe right there in and of itself. I'm so happy to have you on the show today. Welcome, Mr. Kristen. Tell us, uh, just welcome to the show and and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I'm glad we could uh, swap, swap shows for a little bit. That's right. That's right. I was fortunate enough to be on your podcast about a month or so ago. And and so it's like, you know, I've I've recently gotten into gardening myself. So, so excited to have you on and tap your brain about some things. But it's not about me. It's about you. So we're going to start by why don't you tell our listeners about your plant based journey and kind of what started it? What was the most challenging for you? and What was the most rewarding aspect for you? Yeah, so uh, I had a really interesting um, journey to being in the plant-based lifestyle. It really started with a dare, actually. Um, during my AmeriCorps experience, which was probably about five to six years ago now, um, I had a team and um, I, I actually started growing food because I got obsessed with growing. Uh, it's a fun fact to the reason I got obsessed with growing. I started with growing to get into my plant-based journey. And how that happened was, um, so there's this program called City Year. It's an AmeriCorps program. You serve for a year or two, depending on what program you're in. And we would do these community service projects. One of the big community service projects we did on MLK weekend uh, was we kind of did like an assembly line, like a food kitchen. And basically we would make these kits of soup for the kind of like elders within the community. And one of the business partners uh, on that project was this business called Fresh Truck. Fresh Truck is basically this nonprofit that converts school buses into produce markets. So I was like, wow, that is an amazing idea. Like going into where what we call food apartheid or food deserts, taking the food to the people, giving them access to what they wouldn't have otherwise. And I was like, wow, this like really lit a fire under me to go and do my research and say, okay. The problem is these and like these systems of oppression that are causing people not to have fair access to food. And so I was like, okay, what can I do? And I was like, okay, maybe I can start growing something and and trying something out. I was absolutely terrible at first. I used to kill everything. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) herbs, radishes, no matter what. But I, I I got enough success. I think I grew like a radish the size of my thumb. And I was just super happy that I could even do that. I was like, whoa, I like grew food, you know, out of nothing. I wasn't using the right soil or anything. And so uh, after a while, I started picking it up and I started growing more and more. And uh, one of my buddies on the team started acknowledging, hey, you're eating a lot of vegetables lately. What are you like vegan now or something like that? 
And I was like, no, I'm not vegan, but I probably could be. And they're like, what? No, 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 not you. Because I, I was the guy who ate everything. I was the guy who was like, you know, when somebody was like, ah, I don't want this anymore. Does anybody want this? I'll be the first one to, to throw my hands up. You know, I was very like active and athletic and stuff like that. So I would just burn it, burn it off. But I was, I would eat everything. So when they said, oh, you can't be vegan, like they actually meant that. And I was like, you know, I'm going to take that as a challenge and try it for a couple of days. And, uh, you know, I, I tried it for two weeks and uh, I did some things wrong. I did some things right. And then I, you know, eventually had some success. I was like, wow, I feel like really great. My energy is like at its max. You know, there was times when I didn't know what I was doing before. And I was like, oh, I am a little bit hungry. I got to figure out how to, you know, get the right proteins and macros and things like that. But uh, overall, I was like, oh, I could totally do this. And then I started, you know, exploring and seeing that there's other people like me who do it as well. There was this book called Afro Vegan by Brian Terry, uh, who is a plant-based chef in the community. And he's a big uh, inspiration for me. And I was like, oh, he looks just like me. He cooks plant-based foods. And it's culturally significant. I think he was cooking things from like um, Southern America. He was cooking Caribbean food. He was cooking African food all in a plant-based style. And so that just captivated me and I kind of fell in love with it. Wow. You, you have said a lot. Um, you, you hit a lot of, of you checked a lot of boxes in that, in that story. I mean, how you kind of overcame, you know, from killing everything to now you're like this master gardener to the perception of, oh, you can't be vegan. And I'm so glad you, you said that because uh, we're going to, we're going to take a quick break. And on the other side, we're going to talk about what vegan is versus plant-based because I find myself using the pl- the term plant-based more now than vegan. And sure. we'll talk about that a little bit more on the other side. Stay tuned to Fix Your Plate with Dr. Monique. We'll be right back. If you want to educate, empower, and inspire our community, we're providing a wonderful opportunity for anyone who feels they can make a positive impact in the lives of others by applying to be an on-air radio personality. To set up an interview, call 877-342-7770. That's 877-342-7770 to apply. This is your chance to step out on faith. This is your chance to get the experience and education that you need in order to launch to the next level of greatness and make a significant difference. WDRB Media is now hiring on-air radio personalities. If this is you, no experience is required, no previous education needed. They do all the training. Call 877-342-7770 to set up your interview today. All right. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, you are listening to Fix Your Plate with Dr. Monique and my special guest today, Mr. Christian Riddick, also known as the, the, he's the host of the Afro Beats podcast. And before the break, he was telling us about his journey toward becoming more plant-based and how it was kind of a dare. And his friends were like, you, psh, no, not you. And, uh, but he talked about how he found a, a chef, an African-American chef who looked like him and was creating foods, plant-based foods that were delicious. And it helped him on his journey because a lot of times people think, uh, they think a lot of things, but some of the obstacles I think or challenges people face are they think they can't be vegan because they won't get enough protein or because it's too expensive or because that's meant for other people um, or that they won't be supported and they won't be able to find food when they go out. So lots of different reasons. But I wanted to talk more specifically about being vegan, using the terms vegan and plant based, because while there is definitely a lot of overlap there is a significant difference that I myself recently have become kind of more aware of. And so I'm being more uh, mindful when I use my, my terms. And this is just since the book came out, the book came out, uh, Doc Fix Your Plate. The book just came out in May, March, April, somewhere in there. Uh, and in there I'm saying vegan, vegan, vegan. And then, you know, as you, as you know better, you kind of, you know, do more research. So plant-based is where you, it's really just a diet, right? Where you just eat plants, right? No, no brainer there. Whereas vegan or veganism is really more of a lifestyle. And so that includes people, of course, who don't eat meat or animal products, but also they don't wear leather or they may not even wear cotton or excuse me, silk. They may not wear silk because it's, you know, a byproduct of, of, of an animal of worms, um, honey, they don't drink honey in their tea. So, and they may not even patronize things like zoos or aquariums. 
So, you know, when you use the term vegan, it's really a lot more inclusive than just plant-based. And that's why, you know, I host a show called Vegan-ish uh, because I'm, I, that kind of describes me. I'm, I'm getting there. I'm not all the way there, but I'm, I'm getting there as far as uh, my journey toward a more plant-based um, diet. So you talked about earlier you in your in your intro Christian, you talked about food deserts. And I want to talk mm-hmm. about that because, you know, I was I, I did a book signing a few weeks ago and I mentioned the term food desert and someone in the audience made a really good point. And she said um, she didn't like the term food desert because a desert is a naturally occurring thing naturally occurring, you know, location, whereas a food, uh, what we're referring to them, it's not naturally occurring, right? So what do you think about that term? Like, do you, as far as you used it, but I mean, as far as um, food deserts, what your your work in the community with teaching or, or gardening, how do you address that as far as inequality in access to healthy leafy greens? Yeah, absolutely. So I actually use both. I first say food desert so people kind of know what it is because that word is more familiar. And then I say, well, actually food apartheid or as some people say, food apartheid, because you're right. It's not a natural occurring thing. People just don't wake up and just become hungry all of a sudden, right? There's systematic things in place that cause them to not have access to, you know, healthy foods. You know, there's histories of uh, redlining and racism that leads to the reason why people don't have food because if people aren't eating correctly, they don't have the energy to to rebel and to to fight for justice and all the things that matter. And so, for instance, I'll give you an example. DC um, has a big history of uh, in big parts of the city there 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 are food apartheid's. So, for instance, so we have wards, right? Um, different parts of DC in wards, I believe all the wards one through six. So let's, let's take this. I think ward three, ward three probably has, uh, more than 10 grocery stores, might maybe even more than a dozen grocery stores. And those places are typically a little bit more white, um, less African-Americans in it. You take awards seven and eight, which are two of the biggest um, African-American populations in D.C., live in both wards seven and eight. Between the two of them, they only have three grocery stores. And it's, it's very, if you look on a map, you'll see it's like all of the grocery stores and the quality of grocery stores are much greater in places where um, wealth is higher, uh, where there are more white people you know, less African-Americans. And so you can see where the line is actually drawn if wow. you look at it on a map. So yeah, it's, it's really in, incredible. And there's a long history we can go down it, but it's not only like the amount of grocery stores, it's the quality of grocery definitely, stores. Definitely, definitely. Because I, I live uh, outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, just outside of Charlotte. And as you're talking, I'm sitting here, I can count easily. I have access to seven to nine grocery stores within less than 10 minutes. Like, and I'm like, who needs this many grocery stores? Now, Charlotte is, you know, busting at the seams. You know, there's new construction everywhere you look. But yeah, I can go to West Charlotte, which is a predominantly African-American community. And, you know, you see, you know, more gas stations or convenience stores or McDonald's than you do, um, you know, grocery stores where there is produce and, and healthy green. So, you know, it, it's... That's a that's a whole nother conversation for you know that that could take us quite a while. But as far as your work with um, what you do in the community, mm-hmm. are you familiar with with any uh, or do you do any work with com- with community supported agriculture? Is that what what you do? Is that considered kind of in the same? Name, so type so of- not not quite. So my work is more involved um, with education. So I work at the Washington Youth Garden in the National Arbor Room. Um, as my main uh, job. And basically what we do is we bring in, my specific role is to work with our green ambassadors, which is our our youth summer program. And so we have students ranging from ages, maybe as early as 14, all the way to 21, come into the garden. They learn how to work the land, grow their own food. They learn about cooking. Uh, They do construction projects like benches and put together raised garden beds. 
And so we basically teach them the life skills that they need to be professionals in the workforce through the guard, basically. Awesome. And we also like to connect them with different people in the food and agriculture space so they can see, hey, you could have a career in this or you can have a career in that. Like you could be a chef. You could be, you could do, we, we partner with people who actually do community supported agriculture. So what does it look like for the life of a, a farmer um, right. who's trying to sustain themselves financially? And so uh, constantly partnering with people who do that work, but our work is really around education. No, that's, but that is, that is huge because, you know, we, we are, there's, there's so much miseducation out there. There's so much in unfactual or uh, non-factual uh, information on the internet and, you know, where people, are, and this is where people are consuming a lot of their, their information. So to know that you're trying to combat that and particularly with the youth, right? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, the rates of childhood obesity are going up, right? And yeah. what comes with obesity? High blood pressure, diabetes, joint pain. I mean, I've, I've been in practice or I've been a physician since 1996. I graduated medical school in 1996. We almost never saw type two diabetes in children, hmm. right? There's different types of diabetes for those listeners Two, you know, couple, two main types of diabetes, type one and type two. Type one is typically juvenile diabetes because it typically develops in children. They're skinny, they're thin, they lose weight and they have to take insulin or they will die. That's probably about 10% of diabetics or so. The overwhelming majority of diabetics are type two, which is obesity related, lifestyle related and so forth. We used to never see that in kids. We're seeing that in children and, you know, people under 18 now. Hmm. So it's so good that you are um, addressing that by having this this educational component, because what will happen then is ideally, right, they'll take that back to their families. Yes. You know, because, you know, when you as as a family practitioner, I would treat the whole family. Well, if you're trying to treat an issue in one person in that family, if the whole the rest of the family is not on board, guess what? That person yeah. is, is going to their struggle is going to be even harder. So the fact that the, you're teaching the the children, you know, and then they hopefully could take that back to their homes, their communities, that is that's amazing. And I bet you they feel so empowered when they are growing things. Like I know me, I, I've started a garden in um, in a, a raised bed. And when those little sprouts came up, I was like, oh, my gosh, because like, <laughs> I'm not the, the master gardener at all. I, you know, I'm fingers across that this, these, these survive, <laughs> but, um, but they're, they're growing, they're thriving. And it's just so like, oh, my God, like that just really what that does to see that greenery. It, it, it's a psychological effect because I'm like, I'm doing this. It's this is growing. I'm going to eat this. It's going to make my food taste better. Like it's such a, a reward. So many benefits. So many benefits. Yeah. So kudos to you for for doing that. So I do want to talk to you though about how we met, which is your Afro Beats podcast. So we're going yeah. to take another quick break, and we're going to come back and talk about your podcast and how folks can listen to it. Be right back. Calling all business owners, all independent artists, and all nonprofit organizations. If you are in need of radio advertising, we encourage you to call 877-342-7770. That's 877-342-7770. Through their Community Give Back Project, there is an entrepreneur foundation that is paying for free radio advertising that's right i said free f-r-e-e in support of our small business owners independent artists and nonprofit organizations please call 877-342-7770 in order to receive your free radio advertising today all right welcome back to fix your plate with dr monique i'm your host dr monique the physician in the kitchen and we are joined today by the one and only mr Kristen riddick the host of the afro beats podcast and we have been just talking about his experience um basically mentoring and teaching the youth of his in, in his area of washington dc about gardening and cultivating edible landscapes you know, that sounds delicious. So I just want to know more about that. When you say cultivating edible landscapes, tell our listeners, you know, a little bit more about what that what that all entails. Yeah. So for me, you know, it's growing wherever you can. 
wherever possible. When I started growing, I didn't have much space at all. And I still don't have a ton of space. I just kind of use the resources around me and do the best I can. So, you know, when I came back to DC after leaving Boston and realizing, oh, I have this green thumb, I want to do something. I had to go back to living in apartments, you know, because I lived in the city. I lived in like an urban area. And so I found creative ways to grow food. I've grown in uh, storage containers before. I've grown on balconies. I've grown indoors under grow lights. I've grown on rooftops. Um, you name it. And you'd be surprised about how much you can actually grow. There's a, a method uh, called a self-watering container that I use a lot in my kind of like small space gardening. And what that is, mm-hmm. is I take recycled material. I, well, first I buy this kind of like long uh, planter. I take a recycled material, say like a, um, you know, you're, if you have takeout for the day and okay. you get those little plastic containers, right? I'll uh, poke some holes in that. I'll put the top on the container, sit it inside the uh, garden box. And then I'll have like a little, um, what is it called? Like a tube, like a hydroponic tube coming okay. out of it. And what that does is that creates, creates a reservoir of water mm-hmm. uh, for your plants to actually drink. So basically I fill that up once a week. And then I plant everything I want to plant in there and the plants drink it themselves. And you only fill that reservoir once a week. So finding creative ways to grow, you know, collards, lettuce, herbs, uh, microgreens, all those things are a lot easier to do than you think. I love, I'm so glad you said that. I'm I'm gonna, you you may have regret you may come to regret saying that because I am going to <laughs> follow it up with you. But no, I think that's great because you you said something that I say when I talk to people about changing to a plant-based diet, which is start where you are. Mm-hmm. You no, know, people think uh, you know, like kind of when they're going to work out, oh, I gotta have the perfect outfit. I gotta do no, you don't. You just have to start where you are. So I love that that concept applies to gardening as well. Um, and, and that you're recycling, you're recycling. So you're helping the environment. So, you know, kudos to you. So tell us about what a master gardener is. Cause that sounds like, you know, bow yeah. down in your presence. So <laughs> tell me what, what that means and how one becomes a master gardener. Well, honestly, the first step of becoming a master gardener is, humbling yourself and realizing you can never master gardening because I know it sounds like, uh, you know, yeah, but like you cannot master anything. There's too many plants. There's too many different ways to grow. And so it's about humbling yourself and and learning and going on the journey, you know, as you go. And uh, so for me, I'll take a step back into my story a little bit. So when I left Boston after doing the city year program uh, where I developed this green thumb, I got into teaching. And the reason I got into the specific school I was at, because I was like, oh, they have a garden. I mean, they had a garden and it looked nothing like it looks now. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous now. But they had a garden where weeds were coming out of the fence line. You couldn't even walk through the area. Wow. And uh, I told the principal at the time, I was like, hey, I love to get involved with the garden club. And they're like, all right, you're in, you're in control. It's your garden. Do what you want with it. And I was like, oh. Okay. (laughs) We're just going to throw me in there. All right, fine. So the school was really, especially the, uh, like the PTA, the parent association was really invested in getting their kids learning how to grow food. And so what they did was they helped me invest into my education and allowed me to take this master gardening course at UDC. It wasn't uh, that expensive. Maybe it was a couple hundred dollars, Um, but I learned so much in probably about a few months time and I was just off to the races after that. I was because you have to do volunteer hours at other community gardens to get the full certification. So I was going around the city, just going to different gardens, learning from here, learning from there, and just taking the best parts and just putting it towards our garden. And uh, eventually I made those connections. I flourished. And uh, yeah, honestly, the best way to learn gardening is to talk with other gardeners and people who have been doing it for a long time. So that's, wow. That's, that's really uh, amazing because you, you're building a network and a community um, and just like anything else that you want to be successful at, you want to have that community. So that's, that's empower. And I, I find that empowering. I, even me with my little garden, I feel <laughs> like, you know, I am growing something. So I can only imagine the scale that you're doing it on and to our listeners. If they want to get started. So we've told them, start where you are in gardening Name something that they can grow in a pot or a confined space um, that, you know, to get to give them that confidence that they can continue to do this. What would you recommend? 
Yeah. So like, let's say um, you don't have a lot, maybe let's say you only have a window. You don't have any space. You live in a high rise apartment, right? Maybe you start with something like a couple of herbs. I like thyme and mint uh, because those are partly shaded plants, meaning they only need three to six hours of sunlight. So even if you have maybe some of the worst life, unless you live in a complete box, you know, <laughs> if you have some light, you should be able to, to start with those and grow those in like a small little pie and, and harvest those and consume them relatively quickly. Um, I also suggest people to start with what we call transplants. So plants that are already started for you. A lot of people make the mistakes that are like, all right, I'm going to start with seed and then we're just going to go from there. The only problem with seed is seeds take a lot of energy and a lot of care in the beginning stages. Okay. If you don't take care of them early, the correct way in the beginning stages, meaning making sure they get enough light, make sure they have enough moisture, then you get them growing leggy and they're not as sturdy when you begin to grow them. So I always tell beginners, go to your local hardware store, go to your plant shop, find some herbs, find some plants that are partial sun. You can usually tell them they'll usually have a marker in the plant and it'll say, oh, this is full sun, which mm -hmm. means six to eight uh, hours of sunlight, or this is part sun, which is three to six. Okay. Go for the part sun, find a little pot. You can start there. And uh, yeah, just look up what are the, the light requirements. I, I have four big ones, right? If you master these four, everything else is pretty easy after that. Okay. The sun... How much sun does your plant need? The water. How much water does your plant need? So the, so the sun, like I said, it's either going to be part shade or full shade most of the time for edible plants. And that means uh, full sun, uh, six to eight hours plus, and then part is three to six hours. Water, it's either going to be a plant, like for herbs, for instance, you're only going to want to water those once a week. They like to be dried out between water. So like your, your mint, your thyme, those don't like a lot of water over and over again. You only want to water those once per week. But something like tomatoes, for instance, you would have to water every day because it's a fruit and it holds a lot of water, right? Okay. So that's an example of thinking about how much water something needs. Soil, make sure you have a good potting soil. We can have a whole conversation on how to oh, fill the I'm soil. Sure. But like, as long as it compost is the main component there, as long as it has a, a lot of great nutrients in it, um, compost is very important and drainage if you're putting it in a pot. Uh, and then the last one is kind of some like air circulation, like get a okay. little fan or, you know, don't put it like directly where the fan is so intense that it's like, you know, going right. back and forth, <laughs> back and forth. But, you know, get some earth you know, some circulation now keep, you know, disease and bacteria from like growing and, and manifesting. Yeah. Yeah. And actually it's funny. I have a, in addition, before I got my outdoor thing, I had the indoor hydroponic and I did, I set up a little fan because they said it makes them a little sturdier as well. Mm -hmm. and I was growing lettuce leaves and it gives them a little bit of that, you know, I crunch when you bite into it. Right. So. Uh, Kristen, I mean, this has been amazing. I could, we could go on and on and on, but we are coming up on our time. And I, but I want people to to know where they can listen to you because I found you. I want them to be able to listen to Afrobeats podcast. When, how long? Just quickly tell us, kind of, how long have you been doing this? How many years have you had this podcast? So I've been doing it off and on for about like four years now, and I just, I just love doing it because it's just a, a cheap way to talk to you know some of the best people in food and agriculture and just pick their brains, you know. So wow. I'm really trying to travel the world and explore the world through food, basically. I love it. I love it. Because food is so universal. Food is truly a universal thing. We may call it different things, but we all have, you know, uh, each culture has something that you can kind of identify in other cultures. So I, I love that. How can people find you if they want to hear more? And I know they do. How can they find you? Yeah. So you can uh, find me on pretty much any social media, Afro underscore beats. Beats is spelled like the vegetable. And then also, if you follow the Afrobeats podcast, subscribe, listen, you know, like. Uh, like, shoot me some emails, drop a comment if you want to, a little review. Um, those are the best ways to find me. Awesome. 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 You guys, I hope you realize what you just got. And this was just a, this is just the appetizer, the teaser. Please follow this brother. He is a, a wealth of information. We, we need this. We need this as a nation. So hopefully you'll be able to pilot some satellites throughout the country and <laughs> really make this grow. I, you've been listening to Fix Your Plate with Dr. Monique. I'm your host, Dr. Monique, the physician in the kitchen. And as always, I hope for you to eat the rainbow Invest in your health one plate at a time. And until next time, be well. Take care. 
And actually follow me on all social media at Physician in the Kitchen. And you can grab your autographed copy of my book, Doc Fix My Plate book at DocFixMyPlateBook.com. Take care.